Good evening. We begin tonight, keeping him honest, with something we have not seen very often from this president, an opportunity to watch him doing more than just making a speech or signing a bill. This afternoon, President Trump let the cameras stay for a bipartisan meeting at the White House on immigration. It was, to be sure, carefully stage managed. There's no doubt about it. It was also a bit of a high wire act, showing this president at work and command in the thick of tough negotiations on complicated issues. It has potential and obvious pitfalls. But it was done, according to CNN's reporting, to counter the narrative that this is a president working and not a president cooped up in the residence watching TV and tweeting. And his supporters are certainly praising him for that tonight. At the same time, for nearly an hour of what must be said was pretty gripping television, viewers, as well as the lawmakers in that room, also saw some of the president's other well-known characteristics, including his well-documented fogginess on policy details and his eagerness during face-to-face moments to be liked. We also got to watch someone who bills himself as a master dealmaker do what he says he does best. And it really matters. On March 5th, a program called DACA expires. That's the program that gives people who were brought here legally as children the right to stay and work here. As you know, the president has been trying to make funding for the border wall a condition of keeping DACA, sending Congress a long list of demands back in October, including 10,000 more ICE agents, also ending so-called chain migration, a crackdown on sanctuary cities and more. Keep it honest, though, what emerged from the meeting today was basically confusion because the president, whether you agree or disagree with him on immigration, was all over the place from beginning to the very end when he said this. I think my positions are going to be what the people in this room come up with. If they come to me with things that I'm not in love with, I'm going to do it because I respect them. So it was that kind of talk that drew sharp criticism from his right for caving to Democrats. And Coulter, for instance, tweeting that, quote, nothing Michael Wolf could say about at real Donald Trump has hurt him as much as the DACA love fest right now. Well, that said, it's hard to know what to think, because what the president said depended largely on who he was talking to and apparently the extent to which he understood the details. For instance, at one moment in the meeting, the president seemed willing to deal with only DACA with no strings attached at all. What about a clean DACA bill now and with a commitment that we go into a comprehensive immigration reform procedure like we did back, oh, I remember when Kennedy was here. And it was really a major, major effort, and uh, it was a great disappointment that it went nowhere. nowhere. Uh, I have no problem. I, I think that's basically what Dick is saying. We're going to come out with DACA. We're going to do DACA, and then we can start immediately on the phase two, which would be comprehensive. Would you be agreeable to that? Yeah, I would like. I would like to do that. Go ahead. I think a lot of people would like to see that, but I think we have to do DACA first. All right. So there he's saying do DACA first, talking about a clean bill. The president agreeing by the sound of it to a bill with none of the other stuff the White House has been pushing for months and then seemingly to agree to comprehensive immigration reform on top of that. But maybe not. Watch what happens next as House Majority Leader uh, Republican Kevin McCarthy jumps in, steering the talk back to those conditions that the president himself has been demanding in the past. Mr. President, you you need to be clear, though. I I think what Senator Feinstein's asking here, when we talk about just DACA, we don't want to be back here two years later. You have to have security, as the secretary would tell you. So, and as Congressman McCarthy talked, the president began agreeing with him as well. It's kind of like three pillars. DACA, because we all, we're all in the room, want to do it. Border security, so we're not back out here, and chain migration. It's just three items, and then everything else that's comprehensive is kind of moved to the side. So I believe yeah, when the president lottery, talks about DACA, and, and a lot, and I think you should add merit. I mean, if you can, add merit based. <laughs> no, I, I don't think I, I don't know who's going to argue with merit based. So in the space of about two minutes, the president seemed to totally abandon his long held positions, then re embrace them, and then barely a minute or so later, seemed to flip back. I think what we're all saying is we'll do DACA and we can certainly start comprehensive immigration reform the following afternoon. OK, we'll take an hour off and then we'll start. So talking to Republican Kevin McCarthy and the president remembers some of the hardline measures he's demanding in exchange for letting several hundred thousand dreamers stay in the country and talking to Democrat Diane Feinstein. It's dreamers first, then what he calls comprehensive immigration reform. Also curiously absent from today's meeting, not a word about this. We are going to build a great border wall. And who's going to pay for the wall? Mexico. Who's going to pay for the wall? Mexico. Who? Mexico. It'll be a great wall. Mexico is going to pay for the wall. Mexico is going to pay for the wall. Mexico will pay for the wall. 
And Mexico is going to pay for the wall, and they understand that. Mexico is going to pay for the wall. Believe me, 100 percent. Again, nothing at the meeting about Mexico paying for the wall. However, on that note, the president did just tweet about the wall. CNN's Jim Acosta joins us. So, Jim, uh, any mention of who pays for it in that tweet? Uh, There's no mention of uh, Mexico paying for the wall in that tweet. Of course, uh, the president has not said uh, since he's been in office, neither has this administration uh, said anything about how they're going to force Mexico to pay for a wall on the border. I think that's been abandoned uh, and left for dead, although the White House press secretary said that uh, the president still believes that Mexico will pay for the wall. Putting all that aside, we we should show this tweet because I think it it offers some clarity, Anderson, to what you were just talking about a few moments ago, uh, which is that the president was sort of all over the place at this meeting. The president tweeted in just the last several minutes, as I made very clear today, our country needs the security of the wall on the southern border, which must be part of any DACA approval. And that was the question that we had all day long, Anderson, which is, would the president be okay with a deal that protects these dreamers now? Uh, gets that off the table so we don't have seven or 800,000 kids who were brought to this country through no fault of their own, uh, actually seeing them being deported on the, on the evening news uh, and deal with this wall discussion later. Uh, the president is now saying very clearly tonight in that tweet that that is not the case. He wants this wall. But listen to this exchange that I had with Sarah Sanders, the White House press secretary, earlier today as I was trying to drill down on that point. Well, it has to be part of a deal in order for these dreamers to have protection. Border security does have to be part of uh, this process. There's a a difference, Why we want to secure our border, I absolutely do, because the safety and security of the people of this country are the president's number one responsibility and his number one priority when it comes to anything that he does. So absolutely. You understand how the wall could be different than border security, sir. Border security can mean drones. It can mean agents. It could mean more fencing. It doesn't necessarily mean a physical And that's part of the negotiation. Association that we expect Congress to have. But you, and you and understand Democrats are saying that they may not be in favor of this kind of deal. That they're if not if Democrats are in favor of protecting American citizens, then I think we've hit a sad day in American history, but I don't believe that to be the case, because as we heard many of them say as they sat around that table when several of you were in the room, they are committed to border security. They do want it, and most of them have voted for it previously uh, before this legislation hit the floor. They so they anything different no is just... Wall. They say thanks, but no thanks for a wall. Jim, I'm not negotiating with you. I'm going to let Congress take care of that. Okay, Anderson. And and so you had that exchange there and you heard Sarah Sanders uh, really using that term border security law. She did not want to uh, specifically say the president must have a wall. That's why that tweet is so important. And I I will point out that I talked to a senior White House official just a few moments ago who said that this wall has to be part of a DACA deal, has to be part of phase one of this immigration uh, two-step that they want to do over the next several months. Anderson, these dreamers are running out of time. The the deadline for them to have this uh, protection uh, expires or begins to expire on March 5th. After that point, they can be deported or uh, they can start to be deported in ways. And I talked to a senior Democratic aide earlier this evening who said this detail matters a whole lot. They don't think the president wants a wall from sea to shining sea, as this person put it. Uh, but if he wants a physical wall like like we've all heard about during the course of the campaign, uh, quote, that is ridiculous and they're not going to go for that. And I think at the end of the day, this is going to come down to will Democrats vote for a wall on the border and I don't know if they're there yet, Anderson. It was also interesting. The president kept talking today about comprehensive immigration reform. I'm not clear he's using that phrase in the way that it is normally used, because uh, that's usually talking about a pathway to citizenship or, or right. trying to resolve what's going to happen to the 11 million people who are undocumented here. Uh, that's right. This has been a very complicated, thorny issue for the last 12 years, and that is whether you allow the 11 to 12 million undocumented people in this country to have a path to citizenship. The president was throwing around this phrase, comprehensive immigration reform today as part of this phase two. You do DACA first, uh, border security first, and then you deal with these other issues later, like a pathway to citizenship. But Anderson, uh, the Breitbart wing of the party, even if it's minus Stephen uh, Bannon, is saying that is amnesty and that runs completely counter. Anderson, you remember we had those rallies on every night on your show runs completely counter to the campaign that the president ran for a year and a half. Right. Uh, Fascinating. Jim Acosta, appreciate it. For more on the political takeaway, as well as what it reveals about how the president thinks and operates, we're joined now by CNN chief political analyst Gloria Borger and Maggie Haberman, CNN political analyst and New York Times White House correspondent. Maggie, how do you interpret what we saw play out in the cabinet room today and, frankly, why the White House allowed us to watch it? 
I think what, the why the White House allowed us to watch it is that w it was aimed at, at quelling uh, these questions about not the president's mental fitness, but uh, whether he's intelligent. Uh, you know, that was one of the themes that ran through the Michael Wolff book, uh, was various aides privately saying that they do not think he is smart. The president is very defensive about his intelligence, as we have seen uh, over the last three years or so. What I think you saw in terms of the uh, four different answers that he gave at various points is what we saw throughout the campaign. Um, he has vague, loose ideas. He can be swayed by whoever he last talked to. Um, he doesn't uh, know the details of these policies at all, and he will often take two different positions that are in conflict with each other uh, within the same sentence. You don't normally see it play out like this in real time, and the White House has done a lot to shield people from seeing what we saw today over the course of the last year. So it was really striking watching this happen. Um, what ends up happening is that the president says these different things, and sometimes people pick one and say, look, that's what he said. At the end of the day, to your point, he often says comprehensive immigration. He doesn't mean it the way we are used to people meaning that term. He means something else entirely. He doesn't totally understand the connotation. The hardliners in his administration have asked him to stop using it over and over again. He still says it. Um, I don't think you could say any more now than you could this morning about what exactly he wants. Right. I mean, Gloria, it was just fascinating, you know, to Dianne Feinstein, he says one thing. To Kevin McCarthy, he agrees and says something completely different and then goes back to saying what he said to Dianne Feinstein. Right. And you could see Kevin McCarthy there trying to kind of set the record straight. Right. And like, I think you mean what you're saying right. is when right. that's not what he said. Here's here's our three things. We, we want DACA. We want border security. We want, you know, we want chain to get rid of chain migration and on and on. The president is sitting there nodding. I think what we saw today was much more about uh, pictures than words because they wanted to sort of counter the narrative of the president's uh, empty schedule, which was written about. They want to counter the Michael Wolf narrative. They wanted to show him as somebody in charge. The president wanted to show himself as somebody in charge. And what we saw there was a president who wasn't the master negotiator, but who came out and said, look, guys, Whatever you give me, I'm willing to sign it. And it was, it was quite <laughs> different from somebody who said, this has to be in the bill, this doesn't have to be in the bill. And uh, I spoke with a senior White House advisor late this afternoon whose phone was blowing up with, by conservatives who were believing that the president have, had kind of sold them out right. on these key issues. Yeah, Meg, I mean, that was the other fascinating moment that Gloria alluded to, which is when he said, well, look, anything you come up with in this room, right. I'll basically agree with you because I, right. I, I respect you all. I mean, that's yep. if he's the master negotiator, I yes. mean, I don't know if that's a negotiating technique or that's just, I mean, it does sound like just throwing it up. It's outsourcing mm -hmm. policy by his administration, which we, again, have seen time and again, but which they have resisted when we have all written it. I mean, again, what I found strange about this event and the fact of it is that a number of people who helped set this event up had to have known. I understand that they were placating him and making him feel better about, you know, to Gloria's point, these were set pieces. And this was about mm -hmm. changing the narrative on television in large measure and about pictures for the new, above the fold of him in the cabinet room. But it's very hard to spend a year telling people, no, he's not outsourcing policy. He's very interested in the details. He really does understand this. And then present this. I mean, as we have seen with uh, Trump over three years now, you constantly get this, who are you going to believe, uh, me or your lying eyes? A and watch the tape. I would urge everybody to watch that entire meeting all the way through. Uh, to your point, Anderson, yes, at the end of the day, I think that was the most sincere point that he made, and it is the one that will be the most troubling to his base, which is just do whatever and I'll put my name on it. You know, Anderson, it wasn't that long ago, uh, it was during the campaign, that then-candidate Trump derided Jeb Bush yes. for, for calling immigration an act of love. And then today at this meeting, right. he called DACA a bill of love. And so <laughs> you could, point. you know, you could see Republicans just going, rolling their eyes all around the country saying, what, what's kind of going on here? Who is this man? And again, it gets back to Maggie's point and your point, I think, which is that this is a, a person who likes to tell people what they want to hear, which is why Republicans go crazy when he's in a room with Democrats, yeah. because he tells them uh, what they want to hear. And I think he wanted to tell the public 
I'm in charge, and I'm really a good guy. Right, which is why he tweeted out now, well, as I said very clearly, which is yeah, actually not what he said. Not very clear. so clear. Uh, Gloria Maggie, thanks very much. Jorge Ramos <laughs> is going to join us as well uh, on this shortly. Next, more breaking news. What newly revealed testimony does to the president's claim that Democrats are the ones who collaborated with Russia? And later, breaking news on possible high-level departures from the White House. In need of great talent for your business, but short on time? You don't have to get lost in a huge stack of resumes to find your perfect hire. You just need the right tools, smarter tools. It can be challenging finding great talent to make your business successful. ZipRecruiter posts your job to over 100 of the web's leading job boards with just one click. Then ZipRecruiter actively looks for the most qualified candidates and invite them to apply. No wonder 80% of employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site in just one day. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Find out today why ZipRecruiter has been used by businesses of all sizes and industries to find the most qualified job candidates with immediate results. And right now, listeners can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free. That's right, free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash AC360. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash AC360. One more time, to try it for free, go to ZipRecruiter.com slash AC360. Dianne Feinstein made news for more than just turning Trump, President Trump momentarily, perhaps, into a Democrat on immigration. In her capacity as ranking Democrat on the Senate Judiciary Committee, she took action that angered some of her Republican colleagues. Keep in mind, it also refutes a growing GOP counter-narrative on the Russia probe, and that is breaking news. What she did was release, against the wishes of Committee Chairman Chuck Grassley, the transcript of Glenn Simpson's testimony. Now, Simpson is co-founder of Fusion GPS, the firm first hired by a conservative paper, then later by the Clinton campaign to do opposition research on candidate Trump. As part of that effort, Simpson brought in former British intelligence officer Christopher Steele, who compiled that dossier, which was a, a, a bunch of memos on citizen Trump and Russia. Now, we're not reporting on any of the more salacious aspects of that dossier. We have reported on the parts that we and others have corroborated. We've also reported on claims by the president and his supporters that the dossier was concocted by Democrats in Russia to damage candidate Trump. Didn't she spend $12.4 million on a dossier that was a total phony? Right? I think it's very sad what they've done with this fake dossier. I think it's a disgrace. It's just really a very, it's a very sad, it's a very sad commentary on politics in this country. When you look at that horrible dossier, which is a total phony fake deal, like so much of the news that I read, when you look at that and take a look at what's gone on with that and the kind of money we're talking about, it is a disgrace. Now, little of that made much sense even before this transcript came out. The notion that Russia, which the U.S. intelligence community had already concluded was working to defeat Hillary Clinton, was somehow also helping her in the form of dirt on her opponent, which de Democrats then persuaded Steele and Fusion GPS to give the FBI triggering their investigation. What emerges instead from the transcript is something far simpler. Christopher Steele, a highly regarded intelligence professional, uncovered things that pretty much freaked him out. Here's a passage, Glenn Simpson being questioned by Heather Sawyer, Democratic counsel for the committee. Sawyer said, so after Mr. Steele had found out the information that he put in the very first of these memos, the one dated June 20th, 2016, he approached you about taking this information to specifically the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Simpson responded, that's my recollection. Sawyer said, so to the best of your recollection, that request or idea came directly from Mr. Steele, not anyone else. Simpson said, that's right. Now, if that testimony is to be believed, the claim that the Clinton campaign prompted Steele or Fusion GPS to go to the FBI doesn't necessarily stand up. We also should point out here that despite a lot of misinformation by Republican lawmakers, the dossier did not solely spark the investigation at all. According to The New York Times, one key factor, among others, was a Trump advisor getting drunk and boasting to an Australian diplomat. As for Steele's motivations, here's what Glenn Simpson told the committee. Quote, Chris said he was very concerned about whether this represented a national security threat and said he wanted to. He said he thought we were obligated to tell someone in the government, in our government, about this information. Perspective, there was an issue, a security issue, about whether a presidential candidate was being blackmailed. More now on all this from CNN Chief National Security Correspondent Jim Shudo, who joins us now. So what are you learning about this concern that candidate Trump, by, uh, concerned by Steele, may have been blackmailed? Well, Anderson, as you laid out there, the, the Trump line, the GOP line on the dossier 
has been that this was a purely political document drummed up by Democrats, pursued by Democrats to political ends with really no credibility. But but if you listen to Glenn Simpson's testimony here, which is, uh, I'll remind our viewers, is sworn testimony when, when you're testifying on the Hill, you hear a very different story of this. This is Christopher Steele, a former agent of the British International uh, Intelligence Services, the MI6, who had served in Russia, knew Russian intelligence techniques, who gathered this information and was concerned himself enough to go of his own volition to the FBI in June 2016 because he believed there was a national security threat here, the possibility of a presidential candidate uh, being black, blackmailed. And in addition to that, when he met with the FBI in September of 2016, he was told that, in fact, the FBI had other intelligence in a similar vein, which we now know is, again, as you referenced, Anderson, uh, this meeting with George Papadopoulos, who told the Australian ambassador that he knew that Russia had dirt on Hillary Clinton. Uh, so now you have two individuals there, one a British former spy and a, an Australian diplomat who felt compelled to go to the FBI because they thought this information was dangerous, important enough. And I might remind you just to point out that when Donald Trump Jr. and others got that information in the Trump Tower meeting in June 2016, none of them went to the FBI. Jim, I understand during Simpson's testimony, one of his attorneys actually said that a person had died as a result of the publication of this dossier. What, do you know what he meant? That, that's right. Let, let me quote specifically so our viewers know what we're talking about here. This is how Simpson related the story. He says that uh, Simpson wants to be very careful to protect his sources. I should say Simpson's lawyer. Somebody's already been killed as a result of the publication, publication of this dossier, and no harm should come to anybody related to this honest work. Now, now we, we've learned that in that comment, he was not referring to one particular person that he knew was killed because of the dossier. But, but you and I have talked about this, Anderson. Uh, nine or ten or so Russians in official positions have died in recent months since the publication of this dossier, since it was made public. And there have been a lot of questions about why that was, some of them connected to this dossier. So he was referring to that, making a supposition uh, yeah. that people might have died as a result of this. It, it, based on our own reporting, it's not clear that he had any hard information that one particular person was killed okay. as a result of this. All right, good to point out. Jim Shudo, I appreciate that. So with all that as a backdrop, we're joined by a member of the Senate Judiciary Committee, Republican John Kennedy of Louisiana. Senator, thanks so much for being with us. We appreciate it. Some you of, of your Republican colleagues have said that the dossier was solely a creation of the Hillary Clinton and Democrats do you acknowledge, based on, on this testimony by Simpson, that it was not that Fusion GPS was initially hired by a conservative media outlet, which receives most of its backing from a Republican billionaire? Well, I, I, uh, let, let me say first that the substance of this, Anderson, bothers me less than the process. How so? I, 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 well, I, I, it doesn't bother me that uh, the American people have presented the facts of the testimony. Um, I, I had not seen the testimony before this. I'm not happy with the process. Um, if, if I had been the senior senator from California, I would have asked to have the whole Judiciary com co Committee come together in executive session and say, you know, here's why I want to, uh, to release this document. What, what does everybody think? But, but having said that, I've, I've not read the, the full transcript. Do you I've think it should have been released? I, I, it doesn't bother me that it was released. Right. I know it bothers some. I think because uh, it's not I'm the not, standard. I, I'm not, it's not the standard protocol to release it, which is why it's bothered some but, senators. But but it, it it doesn't bother me to have uh, the American people know the facts, or at least the alleged facts. I don't think, based on what I've read, that it's going to change the trajectory of uh, Western civilization. I also I don't know Mr. Simpson, and I don't know Mr. Steele. They may be perfect perfectly credible. They also may be a couple of whack jobs. I don't know. Right. I'm going to I'm going to depend on the FBI to, and the Department of Justice to sort all of this out. And I think eventually they will. And once they do, I hope they will make an exception to their normal procedure and actually report the facts that they have found to the American people. Does it impress you at all? And again, you said, you know, as and, you know, few people know Steele directly or Simpson directly. According to Simpson's testimony, Steele went to the FBI on his own volition out of concern that candidate Trump may have been blackmailed. Does that uh, does that impress you about Steele at all? Or, and do you think it undercuts any of the narrative that Steele's motivations were were just political in nature? Well, I don't know if it's true. I'm not saying it's not. Mr. Simpson may be telling the truth. He, is, he also may be trying to cover his own rear end. I just don't know. Right. He, ha he has an opinion here. 
Uh, I don't He's know testifying what, under oath here. I understand. Yeah. Um, um, people have been known to lie under oath around here as well, <laughs> uh-huh. um, as, as we both know. Yeah. It, this is just... So, you so know, are you it, saying it's, you it's, don't it's believe one, him or you, you just don't know? I, I'm saying I have no way of knowing. Right. He, he may be perfectly credible or he may be a whack job. Right. I, I'm depending on the uh, Justice Department and the FBI... Uh, and Mr. Mueller to get to the bottom of this. And I think if we all let them do their job, they will eventually. I hope they do it. I hope they're thorough, but I'd like to see them, see them do it sooner rather than later. I'm not, I don't want to have a big fight with my colleagues right. like a bunch of kids in the back of a minivan <laughs> over something that's already been done. The transcript is out there, yeah. and, and I don't think it, I think the song will come up tomorrow. Let me ask you, Senator Coons, your Democratic colleague on the Judiciary mm-hmm. Co- Committee, told Armando Raju that the release of the transcript shows that the investigation has reached an impasse and that bipartisanship is effectively over for that panel. Do you agree with that assertion? Because, I mean, that's a, that's a pretty a serious and, and kind of depressing assertion. No, I don't agree with that. And I, I, don't, I, I like my colleague, but I, I don't uh, know what his basis for saying that is. But most of this stuff has g- gone on between the chairman and the ranking member, both of whom I have, have extraordinary respect for. But they each have one vote. I have the, the same thing, one vote. Um, I would have preferred if Senator Feinstein had, had called the committee together and said, hey, here's what I'm going to do. I want you to know about it. Here's what's in the, uh, the documents I'm releasing. Um, what do you think? I, I would have extended to her that courtesy. She didn't. It's done. Um, you know, um, it's not the end of the world. That's yeah. my attitude. Well, Senator, I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. You bet, Anderson. All right. Ahead, talk about Steve Bannon. Remember him, President Trump's key political advisor, who was going to lead a populist revolution once he had left the White House? Well, there's another chapter in his not-so-long goodbye. That's next. The Situation Room is the command center for politics and breaking news. Join me, Wolf Blitzer, for extraordinary reports from around the world. The Situation Room with Wolf Blitzer, weekdays at 5 Eastern on CNN. Well, in the annals of falls from grace, this one is pretty near the top. Former key White House advisor Steve Bannon is now out at Breitbart, the very conservative website that he helped catapult to fame. Bannon, of course, furiously battled Republican Senate leader Mitch McConnell and much of the Republican establishment and is the man whom President Trump said had, quote, lost his mind after being quote, quoted liberally and thoroughly in Michael Wolff's book, Fire and Fury. CNN political analyst Joshua Green, someone who knows a lot about Steve Bannon, wrote a book about him. He wrote Devil's Bargain, the book chronicling Bannon's fiery ascent alongside Donald Trump. He joins us now. Josh, how much of this is as a direct result of the fallout from Wolf's book? Because the the spin from the Bannon camp is it's because he wants to focus on politics. Yeah, I, I think the Wolf book was the straw that broke the camel's back. This has been in the works, this split up, for a long, long time, going back... I mean, there was almost, anger over your book as well. Right, and I'd say it goes back even farther than that. I mean, in the earliest weeks of the administration, when things started going off the rails after the travel ban, uh, Bannon took a lot of blame for that, and it made him a lot of enemies in the White House, and yet he continued to talk to the press. Obviously, he talked to me at great length for my book. Uh, to Michael Wolff at great length for his book. Um, But what really, I think, bothered the president was uh, the public perception that Bannon was the true architect uh, of Trumpism and of the campaign victory, which he was, incidentally, uh, but not Trump himself. And I think Trump finally got tired of it. And then when you had the comments about treason, the meeting between uh, Don Jr. and the Russians that that Bannon talked to Wolff about, I, I think that pushed it to a level where people realized collectively around Trump uh, that Bannon was really doing more harm than good. You know, it's interesting because, you know, the the Bannon people are saying, well, he wants to focus on politics and that's why he's moving away from Breitbart. That doesn't really make much sense. I mean, without the platform of Breitbart, how is Bannon going to get his message out? I mean, if you want to get involved with politics, having the platform of Breitbart behind you or underneath you is a huge advantage. Yeah, we know, Anderson, I was doing some reporting literally right before we came on the air, uh, talking to people around Bannon and Breitbart. And as recently as a couple of hours ago, Bannon thought he was going to be hosting his radio show on Sirius XM tomorrow morning. Uh, We found out this afternoon Sirius sent out a statement saying he was fired from that show, too. So when you remove uh, the influential 
platform of Breitbart News and his national radio show, he no longer has any kind of an outlet to spread his message and to exert any kind of an influence. Bannon's plan over the last couple of days had been to, you know, issue this statement, try and get back into Trump's good graces, but to go out and to continue to kind of build this movement, give public speeches. I know that as recently as two days ago, he was meeting with donors. Uh, so somehow or other, he really didn't see the end coming, uh, but it came today and it came very suddenly. And swiftly. I mean, just in terms of his relationship with the president, the White House says that there's no way back into the president's good graces. Do you believe that? Is the relationship, do you think, fully severed? Well, you know, Trump is famous for firing people and then circling around and still talking to them. He did it with Corey Lewandowski, his first campaign manager, Paul Manafort, his second. And he did it after Bannon left the White House in August. Uh, however, None of those guys have been buried to the degree that Bannon has been buried, not just by Trump, but but by the Mercer family, uh, his financial benefactors. He's now been kicked out of Breitbart News, which he did probably more uh, than anybody else to kind of lift up into the right wing power that it became in the election. Uh, So he's pretty far down in a hole. It's really hard to see how he would maneuver his way back, uh, you know, into Trump's good graces, you know, unless Trump were to run into some kind of a serious problem where he felt like the need to reconnect with the base uh, was necessary and that that somehow Bannon could help him there. But without these platforms, it's not clear that Bannon himself is going to have anything like the influence that he once did. Yeah, I mean, the turnaround is, I mean, it just kind of boggles the mind. Josh Green, appreciate it. Thanks very much. Coming up next, more breaking news on which key staffers in the White House could soon be leaving the White House. Want more than just the headlines? Join me, Don Lemon, on CNN Tonight for a no-holds-barred breakdown of all the day's top stories. CNN Tonight with Don Lemon, weeknights at 10 Eastern on CNN. More breaking news tonight, the possibility of big White House departures, a source telling CNN that aides have been told to decide whether they intend to stay or go. Jeff Zeleny is at the White House tonight, joins us with who may potentially be on the way out. So what have you learned, Jeff? Anderson, there definitely is a sense here that there is about to be a big, if not shakeup, certainly turnover before this second year begins. And two senior officials of all of those mentioned here are two people potentially being mentioned as names. That's Don McGahn, the White House general counsel. He, of course, is at the center of so much of the Russia investigation, how the president's handled it, so much else, of course, judicial nominations. Now, we do not know if he is going to actually depart, but he certainly is a name being mentioned here. He's been at odds with the president on some matters, so he is... uh, being mentioned as a possible name. H.R. McMaster, the national security advisor, someone else also, we are told, is uh, at least being uh, considered in discussions for potentially moving on. Of course, he's a three-star Army general. He is still a government employee. He is, uh, of course, uh, like most three stars, uh, would like to end their career with a fourth star. Uh, So that is potentially something that could happen. But beyond all of that, Anderson, much more uh, the rank and file National Security Council members, National Economic Council members, a lot of those uh, senior administration officials we talk about so much will decide in the coming days if they'll take their leave or not. Chief of Staff John Kelly wants an answer by the end of the month or sooner. Is that kind of turnover expected? I mean, at the end of the first year or is this different? Because I mean, often in White Houses, you hear after the first year people, you know, switching. It's not uncommon, but it's more than we've seen before. I remember the first year of the Obama administration, the first year of the Bush administration. I covered both of those White Houses, and it definitely is more turnover than that. But, Anderson, even more than that, there's not a bench that is waiting outside of this White House, a Republican bench, to come in and fill those positions. Simply, uh, you know, uh, several people uh, don't want to endure the legal consequences, potentially, the legal costs, potentially. So the turnover is somewhat common, but more than we've seen in previous years. But the big deal here is there's not a bench the president can turn to to hire at least talented people in some of these top spots. And what about Bannon's former role in the White House? Are they looking for a replacement? Well, that's well, that's a key question here. He was the chief strategist, of course. That is a central player in the midterm election campaign. So I am told that the White House is looking for, if not a Bannon replacement, a strategist to pull up all together of uh, policy, politics and things. So that is something that uh, this White House is looking for. We'll see who they can find to fill his shoes, Anderson. All right, Jeff Zellin and Jeff, thanks for the next few weeks. My buddy Chris, uh, Chris Cuomo is going to take over the 9 p.m. hour right here on CNN. So, Chris, what should we expect tonight? 
You know, we got a big show tonight, my friend. We have former White House Communications Director Anthony Scaramucci. We just got lucky there. What a perfect guest to talk about Steve Bannon being out at Breitbart in this almost like amazing spell breaking we saw. Once yeah. Bannon was out, all of a sudden you saw a totally different Trump on an issue that was such a signature issue for him and Bannon. So, you know, we have this special to take a look at where things stand now at the end of the year. We picked the uh, perfect night to start, my friend. And I have to say, I'm usually getting ready to go to sleep right now. I watch your clips in the morning. The show was amazing live. <laughs> I got to tell you. Flattery will we'll get you better everywhere, Chris Cuomo. Live. All right. Thanks very much. Good luck tonight. We look forward to it. Coming up next, back to immigration. Jorge Ramos uh, joins us next. Comprehensive immigration. Well, back to our breaking news on immigration reform efforts. President Trump tweeting tonight, quote, as I made very clear today, our country needs the security of the wall on the southern border, which must be part of any DACA approval, which, of course, he didn't actually say during that nearly hour long on camera immigration debate today at the White House. I talked with Univision's Jorge Ramos before the president's Twitter message. Jorge, based on what the president said in the meeting today, are you clear where he stands on DACA right now? Um, no, I don't. I don't know exactly what the president wants. At some point, he said he wanted the DREAM Act. Then he said that he wanted comprehensive immigration reform. Um, I don't know if he knows, but that means legalizing 11 million people, the same 11 million that he wanted to deport during the campaign. So I, I don't know exactly what President Trump wants. Uh, what I know for sure is that I cannot trust President Trump when it comes to immigration. I, I cannot understand how come the same person who ended DACA, hurting 800,000 dreamers, now says that he wants to legalize him. The same person who ended TPS, which is a program that protects people from El Salvador, um, Haiti, and Nicaragua, the same person who did that now says that he wants to legalize 11 million. I don't understand exactly what he wants. Um, maybe the only thing that is clear is that he wants a wall, a wall that is completely useless. When he, when he talks about the DACA deal as a, as a bill of love, uh, you just don't buy that. That's just talk to you. I, I, I don't trust President Trump. This, a, a little history lessons here. The president who established DACA was Barack Obama in 2012. The president who ended DACA in September 2017 is Donald Trump. That's what happened. Th those, are the, those are the facts. Now, it is very hard for me to understand that the same person who ended DACA now says that he wants to help the dreamers. I don't buy that. So, I, I hope that I'm surprised at the end, Anderson, but at this point, I don't trust President Trump on immigration and, and for that matter, on, on almost anything else. Congressman Steny Hoyer is taking issue with the White House account of the meeting, saying it laid out the Republican priorities, not the Democratic ones. Does I, I assume this miscommunication doesn't doesn't surprise you at all? Um, yeah, because what I heard from the meeting, which, by the way, was remarkable and unprecedented, it was fantastic just to listen to what they were saying, how they were discussing all these important issues and they're important issues. DACA is really important, what they call chain migration, which is really family reunification. Those are code words from President Trump saying that he doesn't want more immigrants from Latin America and Asia, uh, what he was talking about the wall. I think those are really important issues. But I, I don't think President Trump has any credibility whatsoever when it comes to immigration at this point. A after the meeting, the White House clarified what they say the first phase of the negotiations would include, border security, as you said, chain migration, the visa lottery, and DACA. Is it realistic to think that they'll be able to come to an agreement on all that in time for the March DACA deadline? I, I, don't, I don't think so. When it, I think it's a myth when we say that the border is more insecure. That, that is not true. There's no invasion coming from Mexico. The um, undocumented population has remained stable for the last decade. Mexico won't pay for the wall. So it, it's a big issue that won't be resolved. I think they have to approve. If they really, look, uh, Republicans control the White House. They control Congress. If they really, really want the DREAM Act, if they really want to approve DACA, they can do it tomorrow. They have the votes to do it tomorrow. And they're not doing it. So I don't think they have time to do that. And if the president wants the wall for the for the DREAM Act, well, um, they can negotiate that. Look, there's already 700 miles of border uh, wall between Mexico and the United States, but it's a completely useless wall. Uh, as we've discussed in the past, thousands of immigrants come by plane or with a visa. So if he says that he's a genius and really intelligent and he wants to waste $18 billion in a wall, let him waste that money. But uh, let's just approve DACA. Well, it's interesting because uh, Hoyer, Congressman Hoyer, also said today that he believes President Trump uses the term wall when he's actually talking about border security 
in, in general, which is obviously different than what he was saying on the campaign trail, if that in fact is true. Yeah, and, and the fact is the world won't stop undocumented immigrants from coming here. Again, almost 45 percent come with a visa or by plane. Won't stop drugs because um, most of the drugs come from uh, ports of entry and, and through tunnels. And as long as you have about 25 million Americans who use illegal drugs in the United States, they're going to keep on coming. So a world won't stop that. Uh, that's not a genius decision. This is not something that a smart person would say. But if he wants a wall, let him have the, the wall. Um, it's not going to stop anything from coming to the United States. Jorge Ramos, thanks. Thank you. Well, coming up, something to make you smile and some inspiration if you've been dealing with bitter cold or ridiculous is next. Time now for the ridiculous, and it's been so cold in many parts of the country. Tonight, we want to talk about the South. Take a look at these pictures from North Carolina. This is Shalote River Swamp Park, and yes, you're looking at alligator snouts sticking out of the ice. With the water frozen, the alligators poke their noses out to be able to breathe, and they're actually perfectly fine. I mean, these guys are die-hard, just amazing survivors, and, uh, and this is just one more example of that. Well, the alligators are brumating, which is kind of like hibernating, but for reptiles in cold weather. And yes, it's a word I just learned today. It's not just the alligators that are adapting to the cold in ways that are both super cool and also kind of terrifying. In Florida, it has been raining frozen iguanas. Iguanas are not built for the cold. They'll fall out of trees. Uh, They'll end up in areas where your cars are, parking lots. You'll see them in a lot of areas um, where they're cold stunned. That's the reptile keeper at the Palm Beach County Zoo who says, don't worry, in most cases, the frozen iguanas will be just fine. If it's just for a day or two, they will just get to where they are completely frozen in time. Um, They're still able to breathe. They're still able to do bodily functions just very slow. So once it gets above 50 degrees, the frozen iguanas start to activate, which sounds like a sci-fi movie I would actually like to see. And there is a way for humans to help. Put them over to the side if you feel comfortable to put them in the sun or put them off the road so you're not running them over. That's good advice. Of course, there is one advantage to a temporarily frozen iguana. Namely, it cannot climb into your toilet. Holy That's what I said. It's freaking huge. That is a lizard, right? If you drop this thing, I'm moving in. Ah! Oh, my God. (laughs) Now, it probably won't surprise you that we had to cut around a fair amount of cursing to show you that video. That was a woman who called a friend to help her with her very Floridian iguana in toilet situation. I don't want them anywhere near me. The kids think it's funny to try and throw them on me. I don't like lizards. So I'm assuming that's why my toilet was clogged, because a lizard was sitting in it. Well, much like thawed iguanas, brumating alligators, and pretty much everything in life, this was a temporary situation, and there was a happy ending for the toilet reptile. As for the spiny-tailed iguana, this is him. Justin Matthews with Matthews Wildlife Rescue said he'd keep him. And his name is Flushy. Flushy, yeah. I think the point is there's always hope for even the most cold-blooded among us. This week looks much better, buddy. It'll be in the 60s. You'll be out in the sun, sun tanning, and enjoying life. As Shelley once asked, if winter comes, can spring be far behind? And as Bill Haley in the comments once said, see you later, alligator, on The Ridiculous. And that's it for us. Thanks for watching 360. Time to hand it over to Chris Cuomo. Cuomo Primetime starts now.